Hi. Apologies for the lack of videos over the past couple of weeks. I've been really busy writing firmware for the AC dimmer controller, which has turned out to be a lot more than just a dimmer controller, which is what it was set out to be. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit more in another video, but those that haven't seen it, this is a sort of main board that I have made at JLC PCB, along with various modules that you can plug in and out, uh, relay modules, there's AC dimmer modules, um, LED strip drivers, that kind of thing. So I made a whole bunch of videos about this unit. Um, and one of the things that we'll look at in an upcoming video is another design of the AC dimmer using uh, some of the IGBTs, a bit similar to that uh, interesting AC dimmer that we looked at a couple of videos ago. Now, what this video is about is um, an interesting lamp, which I noticed while I was browsing around on eBay. I always like to have a look at job lots and um, new other items that are normally things that people have bought and never got out of their box. Now, what interested me about this particular lamp um, is this is one of the um, Philips dim tone lamps. And what that means is that when you uh, dim the lamp, as it gets down to the lower brightness, it actually decreases the colour temperature down to around 2200 Kelvin. And what that does is it kind of simulates what would happen with a incandescent lamp when you dim it down. You get a really nice atmosphere with that much more orange light at low brightnesses. Um, if you've ever tried to use standard LED lamps in something like a lounge or something like that with dimmers, you don't really get that same effect with just decreasing the brightness. So these um, dim tone lamps are quite nice. And in fact, uh, the one that I did most of the testing with with this unit is a newer model than this one. So this is kind of the upgraded model. Uh, this one also had the dim tone thing. So you can see here it says 2200 Kelvin up to 2700 Kelvin. Now this uh, upgraded lamp is far more efficient. But the thing that I thought was quite interesting is I saw the picture and it looks like it's using one of those remote phosphor type lamps. Now those seem to have gone out of fashion a little bit. Uh, what that is, is a lamp that uses primarily blue LEDs and then separate to the LED itself. In fact, you can see here, this is quite clearly a remote phosphor light. Um, Philips did do quite a range of these um, lights with remote phosphors to try and gain efficiency but they seem to have gone out of fashion a little bit now and they've gone to using discrete LEDs but basically there's an array of blue LEDs and then some kind of structure some plastic or something like that that's been coated with the phosphor and what that does is rather than uh, having LEDs that are naturally quite directional you can have the LEDs just around on a flat PCB pointing up at the remote phosphor and then depending on how that remote phosphor is shaped, um, you can distribute the light more effectively with that. And also it gains some other advantages. For example, you can use much higher power blue LEDs without heating up the phosphor to the same extent. So you don't get the color shift and a lot of those uh, things associated with white LEDs. Now, obviously the thing that interested me about this lamp is if this is one of these that can change color temperature, how on earth is it doing that? with a remote phosphor setup because these are just blue LEDs presumably on the PCB and so on these on these types of lamps basically there's a couple of LEDs that are 2200 Kelvin and then the rest are 2700 Kelvin and when it gets to a certain brightness the 2700 Kelvin LEDs turn off and it's just those few remaining LEDs that give that nice warm effect. Um, so I wanted to test this and see if it really does give that same kind of effect and then secondly we'll tear it down and have a look at how it's actually doing that. So just a couple of interesting points about these lamps. Now if I remember correctly Philips originally introduced these remote phosphor lights as part of a challenge to see who could make the highest efficiency AC retrofit lamp. Um, however things have apparently come a long way since then. If you look at the specifics, so this one is rated for about 470 lumens with an AC current of 65 milliamps. It doesn't say anything about the power factor. But on these newer lamps, we're getting almost double the amount of light out of it for less current, 45 milliamps. So things have really come a long way with these very small surface mount white LEDs. And something that I hadn't really appreciated how nice was about this lamp, which I've actually had running for quite a long time now, um, this is going to be quite difficult to film, but no matter what angle you look at this lamp at, you can actually see the LEDs through this optical piece in the centre. So you can see the LEDs all the way down here, which traditionally would be very difficult to get this kind of light coverage at this angle. 
you keep on going up and you can still see that orangey effect around here apologies for the overhead lights um, and as you keep going round you can always see some of these LED emitters and then as you go round you start to see the ring through this central section and this gives a really nice distribution of light in the room so this really nice optical structure um, this is all plastic on this one um, really gives a very nice light output and kind of gets away from needing that kind of remote phosphor setup to get a nice distribution of light. So let's take a look at the operation of these lights and just see how the color temperature shifts. So at the moment we've got it on quite a high brightness and you can see that there is a gap in this LED ring. So we've got, uh, I think it looks like three groups of three plus a group of four. So about 13 LEDs here. And these are the 2700 Kelvin LEDs. These ones aren't lit up. So four are the 2200 Kelvin LEDs. And as I bring the brightness down, you can see that those LEDs start to illuminate. And now by eye, I can see quite a shift in the color temperature. And as the brightness goes down and down and down, we're just left with those four illuminated. Now this is actually giving really quite a nice glow and it really does simulate a standard incandescent lamp really quite nicely. So these are uh, really effective lights. And also you can see what I mean about this optical piece. As we move around, you can always see light from the LEDs being emitted, either from the LEDs directly, or we can see it from this optical piece in the middle. It's really quite an effective design. So this one works quite nicely. Let's try with the other light and see if we can see the color temperature shift with that. So we've got the other one plugged in now. This is at pretty much minimum brightness and this is actually very convincing. It really looks like it's just glowing like a traditional incandescent light would. It does look like potentially there might just be some amber LEDs under there to supplement the white LEDs because this is a very nice glow. And as we increase the brightness uh, and incidentally the dimming on this isn't quite as linear as on the other one. There's a weird step around there. But if we go up to full brightness, now there is a significant color change and it's definitely around that 2700 to 3000 Kelvin region. So it is definitely doing a color shift. Um, I just think they might be using some colored LEDs rather than uh, anything to do with the remote phosphor itself. So I think the next thing to do is to try and get this lamp apart and see if we can see what's actually going on inside. So step one is complete. I managed to smash the glass and get it all from around here. It was glued in quite heavily. Uh, but we can confirm that this definitely is a remote phosphor lamp. If we shine a UV laser, you can see it gives a very red orangey glow. It saturates the camera a little bit, but yeah, that's definitely remote phosphor. So I think the next thing to do uh, is we'll just power it up quickly and have a look more closely at what is going on inside the globe. And then we'll try and take it apart a bit further. So if we turn it on at minimum brightness, what you can see there is quite obviously it looks very much like an amber LED. Now as I increase the brightness on this one, it's not quite as smooth as the, as the other one. And I think that point there, that little flicker, is where the white LED driver is actually starting up. And then from that point on it's quite smooth and you can see quite a shift in the colour temperature. But I wouldn't be surprised if on this one there's actually two separate drivers for the two separate circuits. So I managed to get the top off, I only stabbed myself once. Uh, that was glued on really well. And one thing I have noticed so far is this is massively over-engineered, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing, it's designed to last a long time. And my experience with these Philips Master LEDs is they do last a very long time. Now I know our friends at David Savory Electrical Services, he does not like the Philips lamps at all. Uh, but I've had good results with them and maybe some of the newer ones that have been cost optimized are not so good but I've always had good results with the slightly more expensive ones. So this is the whole remote phosphor assembly screwed into uh, this part here and this is what was actually holding the glass dome in place and it looks like I was correct. So we've got an amber LED in the center here and then five blue LEDs and these are Luxian Rebel LEDs. So at the time uh, this does set this back probably 10, maybe 5 years. Um, is that a date code? 2014, so yeah, about 7 years. Uh, Luxian Rebels were extremely bright for their time, but they did burn a lot of power and they got very hot. So um, 
it's not surprising that this doesn't have the highest um, efficiency compared to some of the newer LEDs, uh, but this was probably one of the best LED lamps at the time in terms of brightness. So uh, yeah, five blue LEDs, so we'll just give this a quick test. Uh, now it has been thermal pasted on, but it looks like there's a bit of a gap. Oh no, it does look like it is. Uh, no, it's kind of pressed into place, but it's not making the greatest contact with the heatsink. However, I may have disturbed something when I pulled this off, so um, it does look like there's a little ridge in here actually. So I think when this is screwed in, this was actually pushing down on the LED PCB onto the heatsink. So I won't run it too long like this, but we'll be able to see what's going on. And we can just start to see the amber LED there just glowing at a very, very low brightness. This is um, basically about 1% duty cycle. If we increase, we start to see the blue LEDs and that's that little flicker as I pointed out. So I think we do have two separate drivers and then we can increase the brightness. And it looks like, as with the other one, the amber LED starts to fade out as the blue LEDs come up. And then the reverse, as we decrease the brightness, we start to see more of that amber light. So it's really quite effective. Uh, let's take it apart a bit further and see if we can see what's going on with the LED driver. Right, so we finally got this apart and that was really quite a mammoth task. Uh, this was built to be extremely rugged and the inside's designed never to see the light of day again. Uh, basically, the way it was set up, the PCB was sitting inside this aluminium casing. Then it was fully potted under vacuum. Um, so this would have been fully waterproof if you use it in an outside light fixture. There's no way any um, moisture would get in here. Um, and then there was an external coating on here, uh, the plastic to make it look nice, so with the Philips logo and everything else. Uh, and then this part sat inside here and this was all filled up with potting compound as well so it had obviously been poured in from this end uh, under vacuum then we have this strange plastic assembly presumably to stop the potting compound leaking through to the top section here and this fed the uh, conductors here through to the led so that went inside there and then the pcb is actually mounted on here now i thought this was um thermal paste it's actually a thermal glue but then there's also some other type of thermal interface here as well. So uh, generally speaking, this was actually built extremely well. And the construction carries through to the PCB. And actually, this is one of the better LED drivers you'll ever see. Everything is name branded. We've got Rubicon capacitors. We've got, a, uh, well, it's NXP now, but it was a Syllogy um, PWM controller. So this is a book converter. So let's take a quick look at the data sheet for this part here. So this is the data sheet for the PWM controller that's on this PCB, the SSL2101. Now this lamp was rated for about 8 watts. Uh, the 2101 is good for up to 10 watts, so within the capabilities of this LED driver. And the system is basically a book converter. There's no need for any isolation in a lamp like this because there's no way to contact any of the LEDs from outside. Um, so this could be a very simple driver, but they do include some additional features designed for specifically for AC LED lamps. So suitable for uh, trailing edge dimmers like the one that I've designed. It's got things like valley switching, which is basically zero crossing switching for the switching element to reduce the losses in that. Uh, and a few other features, demagnetization protection, over temperature, over current, all those kind of things. Uh, Inside the chip is relatively complex. There's a few additional features so you can limit the amount of um, current into your LEDs through a PWM pin on here. Uh, and then if you take a look at the actual application circuit, this is very similar to what's been implemented on the PCB. Now Philips have gone the extra mile and included quite a lot of additional components on the AC side for EMC purposes. So there's quite a bit more in the way of suppression capacitors and uh, we've got an inductor here uh, to try and suppress some of the noise coming back out. We've got a couple of fusible resistors um, so that if something does go over current in here uh, these resistors will blow and then this is where the bridge rectifier is and then most of the electronics in here is pretty similar to what's on the spec sheet. We've got our switching element here and then we've got the smart parts around doing the actual dim tone dimming. So from what I can see of what's on here, the actual 
output to the LEDs is exactly the same as the application circuit, but then there's a bit of additional circuitry here and here, which actually deals with switching between the two LED banks. Now, what we've got is five blue LEDs in series and a yellow LED on its own with a common anode. And excuse the drawing, I've just quickly sketched this up. Basically, what I can see they've done is we've got the series circuit of blue LEDs and the amber LED. And then there's a little chip here, which is a load switch. And what this does is basically switch in and out the amber LED. And because these are connected effectively in parallel, what happens is normally this load switch is on and that keeps the amber LED on. Um, but because the forward voltage across this is much lower than the forward voltage across these, uh, because it's a diode, uh, preferentially all the current will go through the amber LED and at low brightnesses, all of the current does in fact go through that amber LED. Then at some point through a current sense resistor, there's a comparator circuit which appears to be oscillating. So I think it's being driven by one of the pins on the PWM controller. And at that point, we start seeing this load switch turning on and off quite rapidly. Um, in fact, at uh, 100 hertz, so twice the mains frequency. And that's where we started to see both of the banks of LEDs on at once. And then once the current goes past a certain amount, this load switch doesn't activate and all the current goes through the blue LEDs. So here's our comparator circuit with all of the um, R's and C's around it, as you'd expect. The load switch is here, a uh, bit, bit of an odd location, but if you trace out the pins, it does actually route up to the amber pin here. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's quite an interesting concept. I had a look at the, and it's well worth doing, have a look at Google Patents and search for Philips Dim Tone. And they've got quite a lot of different application, uh, well, patents, but with applications and different ways of implementing this electronics. Uh, this is quite a simple and elegant method. A lot of the um, methods described in the patents involve the use of microcontrollers and that kind of thing, which is fine, but isn't really suitable for the lower cost type lamps. You don't want to be programming loads of chips, although you can program them in advance. Um, but this, PCB has actually been designed very nicely with some really quite expensive components. So for the price that this is, this is actually a pretty good lamp. Now, um, as I mentioned, David Savory, he's had some trouble with uh, these Philips Master lamps, and I suspect there has been quite a lot of cost reduction. This, as you can see, is quite a complicated affair, and a lot of effort went into making this. Uh, these newer lamps, although still uh, looking pretty good and pe perform quite well. Uh, this whole thing is a lot lighter and I suspect there's quite a lot of the electronics that's been stripped out of these lamps. Uh, but yeah, really quite light. Uh, doesn't appear to be the same amount of heat sinking compared to these, but as I said, these Rebel LEDs were really quite power hungry. Not as efficient as today's much smaller uh, LEDs, which they've managed to fit a lot more of, so you tend to be able to run them at a more efficient operating point. So anyway, I hope you found this video useful. It was just an interesting item, uh, not really of any specific relevance, but um, I do like looking at these LED lamps and that kind of thing. And when I see something that's quite interesting that uses these remote phosphors, uh, I was quite curious to see how they were doing the changing color temperature. And it turns out it's just uh, an amber LED in there. So anyway, hope you found the video useful. If you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. Don't forget to visit JLC PCB if you're thinking about getting some PCBs or making some of your own LED devices. A big thank you to my Patreon supporters. Until next time, thanks for watching.